get such a thing to help people plan projects that way. Mm -hmm. It would be wonderful. And I thought that you'd want to do the recording of the room on that one because it's higher dense definition of this. Yeah. You, maybe you do that afterwards, you maybe know. That afterwards. Yeah, because I'm I'll get a little tired. Yep. So you've already been here for a while, so. Are you ready? So, oh, yeah, ready. ready? Yeah, we're ready. Are you recording yet? Yeah. All right. So, I want to say all this is done because the shame Yehud Kutshebrich Hashinti. We want to really help the Shechina to be connected with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and the world should heal. The world needs to heal. So that's the motivation. I'm glad to do this for you because in some way this is a kind of, uh, how would I say, a, a, a will, a last will and testament. Apologia pro vita sua to say something about what I think things are about for me. I believe that our task is to look at reality and see it most clearly from a perspective of being a Jewish cell in the body of the world. Yeah. If we can do that, that's what I call being, taking on oil Malcha Shemayim in a sense, and say that whatever the Rebbeinu Shalom has implanted in me, when I stood there and they were making me swear to eat Tzadik Valtei and when I heard as me, Eshlachu Mi Yeruch Lano, and I said, Hineni, I'm here. At that point, the Rebbeinu Shalom as it were burnt an Ipram in me. And every time when I have to go and get to a place to ask, Ma Hashem shoyel me imoch, I have to do a reset on my whole system because it picks up a lot of, lot of schmutz. This is computer language, but if you understand what I'm saying is that we have been given a particular thing. If you want to say it in other language, you say, it's the Torah that I learned from the Malach when I was in the womb of my mother. And to be able to come back to that, that's what the biggest avoider is in our day, to that each one should be at this point, not as it was then only in the past, but mitzad. As it was at that point, knowing this moment in time, when we have two nodes of triangulation. One is Har Sinai and the other one, and with it the tradition, and the other one is Terim and the Shemaim, as it's coming down right now. Now, if you understand Klal Yisrael, the best model I have for Klal Yisrael is a tree. In which way? The tree has bark. Those are the secular people. The tree has wood, and those rings from the past are the tradition. Year after year, another year, ring is being added. And the important thing is that the growing edge underneath the bark, that's where the lachluchias, that's where it goes through, that's where it is new, that's where it's fresh, that's where the tree lives. Now, you might say if the growing edge is what's required, then why bother even having the wood? The answer is, while the wood is rings from the past, it gives stability to the tree. And in this way, I see that I was deployed to work on the growing edge of things. And what is the job? In other words, we have to grow a, a template, a matrix, from which Klal Yisrael can operate. Klal Yisrael has some people who are bones. That's to say, etzem, atzmiyus, all that, thing. and they are the skeleton, they hold it up. And then there are some people who are the, that's the, the, the offer, 
part, and then there are some people who are the Mayim part, and they have to do with nutrition, with money, with all the kind of stuff, the Tamchen, the Reise, and so on and so forth. They're the people who are the air part, and they're the ones who are the speakers for things. And then they're the people who are the Aish part, and those are the people who are most connected to the Yud of the Shema Vaya. And so everybody has its place. But all the ways in which from the utmost of sigma minus two to sigma plus two, all that has to happen on a template. And that template I call Yiddishkeit, or if you will, the DNA of the Jewish organ in the organism of the world. Now, Professor Heschel had a good way of talking about that. He said, the Torah is an answer, but we lost the question. And that's a good thing, because every Erev Shavuos, when we have a Mishmar, I keep asking the same question, what are the questions that we have for which we expect the Torah to be an answer? Today, I want to say it a little differently. And I have some questions. I have a question, what is the cosmology? How would I put it in other words? What is the Shior Koime? What is the way in which Da'as operates to know? Because Chochmah says, aha, I have a good idea. Bina says, oh, yes, I understand it. But then Da'as comes and checks it out. Is it true? Da'as is the reality tester. And what we don't have at this point is a map of reality which will help heal the world. To me, healing the world and uh, to lift the Shechina is one and the same. And if we don't have that place, the whole issue of Asher Yeshua Yisecho, this is the house that God has given us in Olam Hazeh because in all the other Olamas you can't do what you can do in this world. So we have to know what are the questions that the world would want us to ask. What is the cosmology that we need to have to believe that we should be so clear that if we understand this, this will bring to the Shem Yichut, to the healing of the planet. Next, what are the ethics that come out, the Bechen, the action directive? If I have such a view of the reality, then that would give me action directives. And this is how we would compare those action directives with the Taryag that we have, and we will find that there is a way in which they really fit. That's my, how would I say, I can't prove it at this point, because we aren't there yet, but this is my emuna, this is my betochen. Okay? Then I want to say that... If we can get an understanding among people in Klal Yisrael that we need each other, so that it doesn't come out to be um, these people, I don't need them in my life. We need them all. Gefen mi Mitzrayim Tassia. Look at that chsidus, that wonderful Torah that says there is all this, Klal Yisrael is all this. If we believe in Klal Yisrael, then you have to understand that the work that I have been doing was not for renewal and it was not for for Aleph, it was for Klal Yisrael because there are some Neshamas in Klal Yisrael who have to go through this space that we have created in order to be able to get, to, to initiate, if you will, initialize in their Neshamas that tafkid that the Rabbi Nishlam gave them when they were created. So with all that, I want to say, V'yinoyam. Adinoy leheinu aleinu maasi yodeinu koinu aleinu maasi yodeinu koinu neyu. Hine ni muchnam zumam. That's quite a hakdama. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you know, we, we know that it says in the Zohar, that a few hundred years ago, we had a big event. And that was we had an opening of the gates of heaven and the gates of earth. And the, Sh- yeah. and the way that we talk about that is we say that this means that there was 
a big advancement, which is what led to science and technology. Yes, and also the industrial this revolution. Came. And the other one is that uh, also, yeah, you're right. Sforum became easy to get by, to come by. And the other thing, though, is that we also had the advances in Kedusha, which was the beginning of Hasidus and the, and mm -hmm. the spreading of Hasidus mm -hmm. in a, a very big way. And we've seen that advances in one also are pointing to advances in the other, mm -hmm. but one of them is easier to see. That is, the advances in science and technology are easier to see. So one of the things that I have noticed about you in the time that I've known you is that you are what we would call an early adopter. Mm -hmm. If there's something available that looks like it could be useful, you find a way to make it useful right away. Mm -hmm. you know, you're discussing about how when you were in Crown Heights, you were the one who was using the mimeograph machine and so on. You, know, you were, are an early adopter. And yet you came from a time and a place where technology was, well, we would call it extremely primitive now. And so you have lived in times and places that encompass both parts of that. You've, you live in times and places that go from the very primitive up into a, a very advanced society, we would call it now, where people are electronically connected with everybody in the world all the time. And so, what I wanted to know is, what did you notice? Was you, was the the improvement of the, or the advancement in Chassidus? You mean? What did you notice in your own life? Yeah. With the changes in technology, as you oh, were an early oh, adopter, sure. how did this change your life? And then later we'll relate that to how did it change your Torah? Good. When I was in school, I had a crush on Herr Levy. He was my chemistry teacher, Naturgeschichte, natural history, all the things, chemistry, physics, all that. Mm -hmm. he, and I really loved that man because he had the kind of seichel to, to make us do things. And he gave me uh, opportunities to do experiments in front of the class. For instance, one experiment I'm so proud of was that I could take some oil and show that oil is a salt, that it breaks down into an acid and, to, and into a base. You know, I was very proud of that. So I thought chemistry was the greatest thing. Okay. Then Hitler came. Mm -hmm. And Hitler brought fantastic improvements, if you will, in uh, technology. He created the Autobahnstraßen. He uh, created uh, a way in which workers would be given vacations that were luxury vacations called Kraftofreude. I saw the, the guys that went to school with me, the urchins, if you will, now dressed in nice Hitlerjugend uniforms and, and being washed and so on and so forth. I th thought the Zeppelins, you know, and in 1936 was already the first um, uh, television that was coming through from the um, the mechanical television that they had for the Olympics. Wow. So I thought if Hitler would only be nice to Jews, we would make a Jewish brigade and free Elsa Soil from the British. Can you imagine that? <laughs> It was a childish thought, but, you know, because he had written Mein Kampf and it wasn't going to happen that way. And I suffered enough during the Kristallnacht when I was in the hospital at that time and so on. So there's a lot of souls. There was a hiatus then because I wasn't, I didn't have much uh, that I could do uh, to learn mental stuff. But I learned how to cut diamonds, and I learned how to be a uh, furrier. And for a while, I worked in a metal shop. Um, and all this helped me somehow to have an understanding of what the reality of things is, you know, how, how to make them work. And where was that? Huh? Where in, was it? In that? Antwerp, in Belgium. Uh -huh. And the diamond thing was with that wonderful group of those uh, Hasidim who were with Rabbi Moshe Chekhoval, who had been studying with Rav Zirozan and with Rabbi Baum Schneerson, the Rebbe's uh, Schwer. 
So those are the people who attracted me first. And maybe we come back to tell about them because Zichram Baruch, they, should, they deserve to be remembered. Avram Weingarten and I, Avram Weingarten, all of us, Sholem, and I were both members of that group. <laughs> then there was a concentration camp for refugees who came from German countries. The French put us into a camp. And there was a time when I went out to make the little shoifer. And I didn't have any uh, tools to do it with, except some wire that I sharpened. And... Uh, an old coffee can in which I boiled the horns and so on and so forth. Nothing much more in Marseille except that there we had that little yeshiva and there I met Reb Shneer Zalman Schneerson, who was the father-in-law of Rebel Yechaim Karl Bach. and through him we started the yeshiva and that's how it happened that the Rebbe came for two bishvat and gave that wonderful teaching that has inspired me uh, thus to this day. It's, he started out, what are you learning? And he said, was learned you? I didn't even know who he was at that point, you know, because he was such an anomaly. All the people who had beards had long capotes and black hats. He came in a business suit with a gray fedora, you know, his beard nicely tucked under. And so I didn't know who he was. But I had such a sense of his dignity when I saw him. So, um, so what do you learn? We are learning uh, Ksubis. So he said L'chaim and begins to talk about Psula Niseis L'yoyim Arvi. And we are Psula to the Rabbi Nishalelem. And he married us at Har Sinai, B'yom Chasanase. And what did he give us for Kedushin? Hashem Kedushin of Mitzvah And when were the Tnoim? Nay his na Kodesh Baruch be Masse Bereishis. So the Chachamim say Shnei Alavim Toyu, Shnei Alavim Toyu, Shnei Alavim Yemay Samashiach. So after the Shnei Alavim Toyu and the Shnei Alavim Toyu, the Yemay Marvi Mashiach should have come, because the other two are Yemay Samashiach. But what that is only a besula. But if Cholila Vechas, we have sin done our various Beshoigik, then we have a Prinos Almona. So the Almona gets married when? Beyoy Machamishi, because Birhas Dogim. But Ube Pishachem Shulcha Imchem, because we did Bemezid, we served, therefore we were divorced, as it were. So then the Chasana is on Friday, because that's the time. When Birhas Adam and Puvu, so it should be on Friday. And I'm making it short because, of course, he laid it out. He asked the question, why do you have to wait? You could have Yashkim Lebesen Biom Sheni, you know, could have got married on Sunday. And says, Noisen Lebsula Gimol Yom Kedelis Kashet, boy, you have to get ready. And then he was talking about the sparks that are here and there that we have to, that's the Kishute Kala, you know. And uh, then he came to a point where he started to cough. And he had a way, when he didn't want to cry, he started to cover it as if he's coughing. And with a sigh, he said, it is already so late on Friday, when will the chasana be? You know, to this day, when I say it, I'm, I'm, my heart spills over this way. Now, I got to see more of this business of how times, you know, that there is a headspace that's called toihu. And you know, it's wild and woolly, it's, it's up to noyach and so, and so on and so forth. That's, that's, that's how it goes. Then there's Torah, and you can see how Torah starts going through the beginnings of uh, Baal ba, Bichtav and going to Rishab al and how, and how it all builds up. And it fills the mind with that. And now comes the time when the zeitgeist, the way in which the mind has to be filled, has to be by some Mashiach. Then, uh, a little later, I had the opportunity to do a Siyam uh, Hashas thing. So, I said that we have six Sedorim. The first Elif was Zroim. 
and it starts with Brochus, right? The second one was Moyet, Kiva Moyet, and then came Teure. Then was Noshim, you know, we were close to the Rabbi Nebuch Nezikim came afterwards. And then we went through the medieval period of Kodeshim, and now we're in the time of Taras. So you see how this whole issue of seeing times not as one uh, thing, but as an evolving uh, mind space. Then when I start to look at history, you know, most of the time when you learn any history, they give you a narrow history. It's Jewish history, American history, and they don't tell you what else was happening around the globe. But if you go after the Churban Abayas Rishon and you ask what else was happening, it was um, Socrates, Aristotle, uh, Plato, it was Mahavira Buddha, it was Lao Tse Confucius, it was Yechezkel Yirmiyahu and, and uh, Yeshayahu, and it was Zarathustra. What was going on at that time, you know? So there is an Indian that there is like an explosion. Like the, the Alter Rebbe says, a tzaddik, when he goes, leaves the body, he spreads all over. Mm-hmm. When the Beis Hamikdash, the first Beis Hamikdash was destroyed, you know, there was such a blip on the radar of, 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 the, of the global brain that whoever had Kalim remembered. Everybody got it, but most of the people didn't have Kalim. Okay? For that, you needed to have the preparation of a Buddha, for instance, sitting in austerity and trying to figure out what's the Cheshma of the world and Lao Tzu. Everybody wants to come up with a reality map. And they got a zap, and then they put out the reality maps that they saw. Now we learn that there is a Hillel way of looking at things, there's a Shammai way of looking at things, depending on the Sherash and the Shammai. Mm. And that's the kind of thing also with cultures. <laughs> that every culture has Kalim, and whatever came down in you know, a Shammai at that point, uh, went into those Kalim they had, and lots of stuff was spilled on the ground, you know, because people couldn't remember afterwards, only those people who gave it a file name, if you will, and then saved it on disk, you know. The, the others didn't have anything there. Okay. Now saying, what does that mean in in Midrash language? to all the nations with the Torah. Okay. Once you get, you ask functionally in history, what does that mean? Then you get a picture of that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So there I am with an understanding of how history and and the, these things go. So that was very important to me, that I began to see history um, as, you know, there is this place in uh, Disneyland, Disney World, where you go into the Monsanto exhibit. Mm -hmm. And as you go in to that snowflake, you know, Mm -hmm. and it changes, um, uh, it changes um, dimensions, as it were. You go to small, small, but then you see it as big. You know, you get to see, now I'm in the middle of, of, of an atom, you know, I see the, the electrons and so on, I see the space in there. That's the kind of, of thing that I'm looking at when I see how we go through different times. And every time the the Olam Shona Nefesh shifts. Did you ever play Zelda? No. No? Zelda was a... a, a I, I didn't play it more than once, but not that, I, uh, uh, that, that I'm against it. Mm-hmm. The wonderful thing about it is that there are rooms, and you start out someplace, and you have to discover what are the laws in that room, how you can fight the enemies there in that one. Then you have to go to another room, and it changes, you know? Right. And so that issue of change has been very important to me, you know? So that goes to paradigm shift and what, how do you get it to be so that plus some shows plus a change, you know? The more there's, there's an element of culture, sometimes I give the marshal, imagine I, I was in Bulgaria and I got some fantastic yogurt and I want to take some along. So I take a little culture along. I come uh, to uh, another country and I don't want it to spoil, so I take some goat's milk and put some of the Bacillus bulgaricus in there, you know? 
and I come to America and I find another kind of milk and I put it in there. What does it mean? Each culture has a different way of doing it, but the the uh, basic yeast uh, thing is still the same. I think so about Yiddishkeit. If you can understand that survival of Yiddishkeit depends on being able to survive in whatever culture we are and still be what we are. That sameness and difference is what's been agitating me all along. So you're saying that in this case Yiddishkeit is like the, like the Dover Maimed that makes it, makes it into yogurt. That's right. Wherever we come, whichever country we come, remember there's a story about the Baal Shem saying um, uh, to his son, or son-in-law, to the Deichel, Odell's husband, he was saying uh, he was captured someplace and he came and the king liked him very much after he had been a slave and so on. And he said to him, why don't you bring more Jews here? Uh, you know, and, and uh, then he comes back and the Baal Shem says, because you went at that point, we don't have to be in Golis there, you know. Okay. It's an amazing thing. So everywhere we, we we were, take a look at the difference in Yehuda HaLevi, Reb Shlomo Ibn Gabirol, and Reb Lozah Kalir, you know. What a difference between their poetry. The, don't you think it has something to do with uh, the land where they were in, you know? And when I hear the Chabad Nigunim, the Daso Ruski, yeah? So uh, it has, we pick up, and that's what Rav Nachman says, Kichumi Zimra Soovis. Take from the, from the song of the land, wherever you are, that's important. Okay, I continue. So then, this is in the back of my mind, I come to the yeshiva, and at one point, there's only one thing I want to do. I really want to learn to daven. You know, see, this is fine, you know, ideas, but how do you do it? This issue of how do you do it is so important. And so I was lucky to have Jakey as my uh, um, mashpia because um, one day I'm davening with this very quetchy face, yeah, 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 and like this. And he comes giving me a whack on the side and says to me, Austrian approved mit guten? Did you already, did you already try uh, with uh, being nice? And they said, no, that you have to quetch like this. So it still hurt and I started to smile in the daven. <laughs> I woofed at the daven and could get off, all right? So these were, these were wonderful things. Um, it was... Um, just about this time of the year, when the mafter is Chazon Oivadio, that we were sitting in this on 770 upstairs, and there's Reb Shmuel and Jacobson and uh, some of the other old Achsidim, Reb Avram Paris, and Reb Shmuel says, Die Bocher im Davene nicht. So, uh, you know, he has tainess on us. So I take a... Uh, a glass, one of those yardside glasses with schnapps. You know, it was a homebrew schnapps, a lousy rot gut. <laughs> and I down it, and I say to Reb Shmuel, how do you expect us to daven if you have never told us what's happening inside of you when you daven? You know? So you teach us chesidus, that's very nice, you know, that that's those ideas. But how do you do it? What 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 happens to you? You know, <laughs> you know um, so he says to Jacobson, who sits next to him, <laughs> you, you tell him. <laughs> so, so, so Jakey says, <laughs> you know, he had this fast way of talking. I work so hard on Davin and he expects me to give it to him while standing on one foot. And I said, Ada boy, yes, <laughs> you know. So, uh, and they're Bruges, and Avram Paris says, "Es doch fortgerecht." He's really right. So they say, "Zog du em." <laughs> so he takes a big glass of Mashke, and he begins with Birches Shachar, 
and tells how what what goes on. You know, I would, I learned so much at that point. If you ask me to repeat this verbatim, I can't. But I have it in my bones. So when somebody says to me, uh, um, "So, what could you teach me about Davin?" and they want deep meditation, you know, and I say to them, "Look, when you say Goli Viodua Lifnekisik Vedecho, can you make yourself transparent so that a Benishlam should see everything inside of you? Goli Viodua Lifnekisik Vedecho. When you say Nishmas Kol Chai Tevor Hashem Hashem Lekeno." And you go and you look at how many things in the world breathe. And all of them are, are, are thanking the Rabbi Nishlam. So there is a certain level of taking it literally. And this is where I give thanks to the Bebrides of Yitzhak. The issue of the Chushat Siyur. Just make sure that when you say something, you may, because the chushat seer is between the heart and the mind. The mind gives you a concept, the heart does the feeling, but without the chushat seer, it doesn't get into the heart. And so these are th 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 so wonderful. So when I talk today about Davenin, I want to say that the matrix of that was given to me by Rabbi Bon Paris, and he should have a lichting in Gandhi. He, he, I love that man very much. But he was the first Meshichist. Yes, in, uh, when the Rebbe was 60 years old, uh, he sent out uh, notices before that, that we should send Yechi HaMelech, Mashiach. Yes, we sent telegrams to him. Okay, wow. so I went and, t and wrote out, typed out three telegrams, but I handed them by hand. One said what... Uh, um, and the second one, I said, <laughs> He said, You know, 60 years, it, uh, happy birthday, you know. And the third one said, If there's going to be any bad stuff coming from this campaign, I take it on myself so the Rebbe shouldn't have to suffer for it. So, you know, these, these kinds of things, if you wouldn't be here, you know, I never had a chance, or wanted even to talk about it, you know. So, there, there I'm in Lubavitch and davening. Uh, so I had all kinds of nooks and crannies where I could daven in. So sometimes on Shabbos afternoon, I had waiting for me a can of sardines that I opened on Friday because I didn't want to open the can on Shabbos. I was a from person at that point. So, and uh, so at four o'clock in the afternoon, I would make Kiddush and uh, have a, a, two bulkalach for challah and a can of sardines because I didn't want to go to any kitchen, to any balabos. I wanted to have the time to daven. So it was wonderful. Then came that incident with the machines. There was Bell Bimgarten and, and, and I. And I'll show you later on, if I haven't shown you yet the handwritten and typed stuff that I did at that time. So I go across the street where Moshe um, Pinchas Katz had the office, the yeshiva office, and the, the dormitory was there too. And one time he asked me to open up the office for the woman who was going to come in and work. And I went to get a key made for myself to coffee. So I'd sneak in at night, and I would type uh, Gestetner stencils on his Hebrew uh, typewriter. And then I broke the carriage, wheeling it in. And they found out who it was, and Rashag calls me upstairs, and there says Reb Shmuel, and Rav Kastel, and, and uh, Rav Mentlik, and Jacobson, and, and, uh, and, and Rashag. And they all look at me with that kind of thing. What kind of a chuspe would you have dared to go into the Rebbe's Yechidah's room? It's all the same territory. You have no right. Mm, da, 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 da. I said, Rabbi, sir, excuse me for a moment. I'll be right back. And I went downstairs and collated now some of those things and brought up the peckloch and handed each one a peckle. 
and before anything else, they say, oh, the Chacholzer, we made the Chacholzer. <laughs> so then they realized what I was doing there, that I wasn't, so I just had to pay for the uh, fixing of the carriage by taking over Mayor Greenberg's class from time to time, and uh, uh, they didn't throw me out of the yeshiva. <laughs> but I had to give back the key and I had to forego from now on. Which is such a pity because, you know, I never had certain kinds of chutzpah. I could have said to them, wouldn't it be good if the Bochim, the yeshiva, would get hold of some stuff this way that they don't have? I'll show you later on. I have a copy of, a handwritten copy of Derech Chaim, the first ten prokim that I did myself because there was no, there was no, no, it wasn't around. It was one copy and I could write it by hand because it was, I lived with that at that time. So, there was already technology in this thing. By this time, I'm out in, first in New Haven, at the yeshiva there, and I had a accordion and I was singing with the kids and I was playing um, baseball with them and, and so on. And made up ditties for them on broches Fruit growing on the ground like vegetables and roots. Bore pre ho adomo is a broche for such fruits. Fruit growing on trees like apples and dates. The broche on them is bore pre ho aids. And so the kids had a whole bunch of things, and that's where my head was. And I went to Rochester, and Rochester was terrible. It was a year in which a broken down yeshiva, no money, and I was the driver, the school bus driver, and the fundraiser, and the teacher, and later on when the furnace broke, I was also the one who shoveled the coke into the furnace in the morning. And then we didn't have any money, and we had to liquidate uh, in Rochester. Before that time, Herschel Schusterman had been there, and there was another day school that was funded by from people, but they didn't want Lubavitch. So, you know, and they attracted things, and we were only getting the kids that nobody else could handle. So it was a very hard year. I decided uh, in Rochester to learn how to be a shaykhut. So I got Kabbalah for Shechite, and learning to put a chalif together is not an an easy thing, so that should be Chad V'cholok, and I, I did well with that. And then decided I want to get out of the kosher business, I'm going to be a butcher because my father-in-law at that time used to be a butcher, and so a guy went to California, rented me his store, I was there, and then the Rebbein Shalom helped me that with the last money that I had saved up, I had to pay for the meat that was in the cooler that got spoiled because the uh, compressor of the cooler didn't work. So we managed a soft soft to get to Fall River where I was teaching Hebrew school and uh, the rabbi of a small congregation and um, in order to make ends meet I would go to, Rochester, to, to Providence, Rhode Island and shech chickens. And they called me the Bebop Rabbi because uh, before, what's he doing now? He's talking to the chickens. I sent them out, and I would, the chickens were dry, you know. Uh, there were, people looked at them not as animals, but as merchandise. So I gave them water first and talked to them. I'm, I'm not doing this from cruelty. You're going to have a chance to get from Chai to Medaber, you know, all that stuff. Then the guys would come in, they would, then they would start talking nivelpe. Uh, you know, what they did the night before. So in order that I should be able to keep my mind on, on things, I start singing. When Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and so they were plucking <laughs> along and singing, and they called me the Bebop Rabbi, and I learned some wonderful spirituals from them too. Okay. <sighs> from there, in, uh, I got more into musical instruments in Fall River and also into um, um, uh, raising tropical fish. 
I had tanks and all that kind of stuff and was having a lot of fun. Why? Huh? Why? Because, uh, <laughs> because it interested me, because it was uh, something with guppies was, was, was great and with neons and so on and so forth. It was wonderful. Uh, you know, go go talk. There was biology, and I was able to be in 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 that in this way. And I also got into high fi at that time. And so I would set up speakers and copy things and so on and so forth. So that's where I got into sound. When I left uh, Fall River and went to New Bedford, uh, I continued there. And in New Bedford, I started to learn Morse code because I wanted to um, have Zalman Posner in uh, Tennessee. In those days, we, you know, there wasn't much radio; it was only AM around. And there was a Moshe Leib Rothstein, I think his name was, um, in 770. And we were going to do every Thursday evening uh, a, um, uh, a ham geschäft in which um, we would ask uh, Moshe Leib what's doing in New York and what's happened and what did the Rebbe say and so on and so forth. And we would tell the rest of the Hasidim which lines we were on on shortwave so they could tune in. It didn't happen. It needed a special antenna on top of 770. It didn't happen. So, but it shows you where I was with stuff. I would drive around, you know, and look at street uh, signs and go, you know, just to make sure that I had my Morse code ready to pass for my ham license. We moved to Winnipeg. And um, I had a choice to go to Gainesville or to Winnipeg for Hillel. And um, Winnipeg had a mikveh and had a day school, and Gainesville didn't. So then, with my kinderloch and the mishpoche, we went to to Winnipeg. The issue was how do you get word out for, from Hillel? Uh, to the students at the various campuses because, you know, it wasn't only one campus. And on the campus itself, you have to have different announcements. So I got a letter press, and I got a uh, multilith press. Both of them I snored from people, and I typeset, and I printed, and that's where I began to burn um, the multilith uh, masters. And um, that's the first stuff, I'll show you a little booklet later on, that I printed that had translations um, uh, from, various, from various things and letters from the Rebbe and so on and so forth that I, that I had done. Because I forgot, I gotta go, go back a little, rewind. In 19, for, just before the Estalkos uh, of the Rebbe Rayatz, Shlomo and I were called in and sent out to campuses. When we made our way, I would take along a, a big Shure tape recorder, uh, a, a horse, you know, <laughs> and it was only taking one one side, you know, not a double, spin, and it was still paper tape. Yes, and I had recorded uh, an hour and a half of Hasidic Shnegunim on the Hammond organ, uh, and I took that along to to Brandeis and and so on and so forth, and printed out a lot of stuff, maybe a graft, uh, spirit duplicator, some of it was, to depend what I had at that time, and uh, gave out to the students there shtiklach of chassidus, of letters from the Rebbe, and so on and so forth. So I was into this business of printing for a while now, from, from the old jelly stuff, you know what? Uh, what is it called? To 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 the best things that we had. So you ask me what what I saw, you know. So by the time it was clear that there 
that you can make sure, sure that the effort that you put in gets multiplied beyond what you can do with your muscles. I was interested in that, and that's how I saw this thing. Um, a comma. I was also reading a lot at that time because the questions were asked by the students, how do you harmonize things? And I had a, a, I had a vikuach with the Rebbe about that. Because I, well, somebody wrote me a letter and said, what do you think about um, evolution? How do you deal with evolution? So I wrote back, what do you mean evolution? We got all that kind of stuff. And this is not the first world, you know, a whole, a whole deal. And I sent, every time when I wrote such a letter, a car, this was carbon copy days, to the Rebbe. And he would send back sometimes something marked with pencil on the side. And on this one, he didn't agree with me to say um, anything about evolution. Hmm. So I came later on to Avichides, and I had it out with him, duke it out with him. You know, uh, why should we say that Rabbi Nishlam is a liar, that he plants fossils and, and you know, and, and makes all these kinds of things happen, when this is not the way he, we are meant to understand reality? And he says, because of Shabbos. If you don't have the seven, the six days of creation, then it injures Shabbos. And, you know, and here again, I'm timid. But this doesn't mean that I didn't afterwards think differently. You're going to tell me that in this cosmos that is so vast, six Earth days, you know, six times the Earth turns around the sun, Yom Rishon. So, you know, I wasn't ready to buy that. But then there was always a question about how will I harmonize with the students with whom I'm meeting and and Teure. So I began to read and I saw uh, various kinds of things happening already with the beginnings of the quantum stuff, with the, uh, the uh, things of psychic research. And for instance, um, I went and worked with a medium and this was an amazing thing. Some of them are fakes and some of them are good. And this one was good. And this was after the Stalkus of the Rebbe. Um, and uh, she said there was a little wheezy organ there, you know, one of those pedal organs. And while she was getting ready, I was playing that nig, Achilalikim. So, and she was sitting in a chair and she stood up and says, he's from the 20th level. He wears a fur hat, he's, you know, he's shining and so on and so forth. <laughs> At this point, I was a little bit uh, taken aback that I made the Rebbe come through a Goya to me, you know. That, that's, that's how I saw it. But um, it was interesting uh, how she tried to give over brachas. At another session before that session, she had sort of channeled my uh, mother-in-law and almost choked on the word Chana. She was an English woman, you know, and she was saying, there's this woman here with a kerchief of to here, and she is watching you and you're swaying back and forth facing a wall with a blanket that has black stripes on. And where do, you know, when you get stuff like this, veridical, so for me, the mice that were always told about Oilemus and and and, Re and Rebbes and uh, and you know the ash boy that comes down, so uh, that was clear, and I found a certain kind of corroboration in these things. So that interested me a great deal. I was also interested in people who wrote cosmology, like Teilhard de Chardin who sees the world first as a lithosphere, a stone, and then sees it as a biosphere, it picks up life, and then sees it as a noosphere, it picks up awareness, and then sees it going to the um, divinization of the planet. Now, when you start saying 
starting with the hay of the lithosphere going to the bulb of the biosphere, going to the upper hay of the noosphere, and then going to the yud of the divinus. You see, all these things coming together for me. And that was very exciting. Should we pause here to swap tips? Sure, what are we up to? Is I'm it at time? Six minutes. Okay. We can swap tips. Yeah. Well, you're not Wait, comfortable. You want to take another chair that you can sit in? I was going to do that. 